from Data Color, and this is the Data Color 2013 webinar series. We're sponsoring this webinar along with Trigger Trap today. We are very pleased to have Trigger Trap as a co-sponsor, and it's a great uh, tool to be talking about when we talk about remote control photography today. So we're going to be covering a number of forms of remote control photography, from the simplest to the most complex. And we're going to be talking about those in relation to um, a range of types of photography, from simple still photography to uh, you know, the high dynamic range stuff and, and uh, time lapse photography and so on, and, and remote animal photography. So it should be interesting. Uh, I am going to be doing the Q&A as best I can. I guarantee you'll have questions I won't know the answers to. And I'm going to be doing that on the chat function. So be sure to set up your go to webinar control panel such that you can see the questions and answers so that I can uh, type stuff in there and you'll be able to see it. While I'm doing that, my friend David Saffer is going to be running the presentation. Now, David is a professional photographer who, who uses this kind of stuff in his own professional work. He's located in the LA area, and today, so am I. Not at the same place. We haven't actually seen each other since I got here, but uh, Cinegear Expo is going on at the Paramount this week, so I believe we will run into each other before the week is over. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce David and let him get started with his presentation momentarily. What I would like to tell you first is that we have lots of great giveaways and special offers at the end of the webinar. So stick around because your your odds of actually winning something today are better than I've ever seen them at one of our webinars. So this is uh, this is a good day to be here. So um, I'm going to let David Saffer take over here and tell you a little bit about his uh, his presentation and then dive right into it. So uh, thank you for joining us, David, and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for that nice introduction. I'm looking forward to seeing you too. Um, I got quite a nice look at the red camera last night, and uh, it's it's pretty impressive. So is the workflow. Um, today we're going to talk about remote control photography. Um, it's a subject that really ranges far and wide. Uh, there's gadgets and widgets and controllers and software galore. Um, what we're going to try and do is give you an idea of what the possibilities are. Um, rather than trying to get into the real nitty-gritty down to the bone details of every single thing we're going to hit some of the highlights and get down to maybe I don't know 5,000 feet uh, elevation and give you a look at them and then you can go and do some more work on your own some more research on your own to decide which item suits your specific needs um, one of the things I want to mention on this first slide is that, you know, particularly with animals, remote control devices are, are very, very useful. Um, the animals are particularly sensitive to people walking around with things in their hands, and if you can get the camera out of your hands and on a tripod or a stand or a support of some kind and then trigger it remotely, you've got a much better chance of getting a good shot. And I have to have to interrupt here, David, and say nothing says remote control photography better than a hummingbird shot. I mean, it's not like you know African lions that might eat you if you get too close. But <laughs> nevertheless, I've I've uh, seen remote control photography used successfully more for hummingbirds than for for any other function because they are uh, so flighty. And not to not to put ourselves in the same league as uh, Franz Lunting, but I was at the EG conference in Monterey a couple of months ago. And he's been doing photography of cheetahs in Iran, of all places, and using quite a few different remote uh, photography devices. And the results were stunning. That's the only word I can come up with. Now, there's a range of creative remote control capabilities. Um, you can do everything uh, in a range from something as simple as um, a remote release that's wired to the camera, which we're all quite familiar with, just to keep the camera steady. There are wireless remote releases that uh, trigger the shutter or allow you to adjust the camera. You can shoot tethered to the computer. Um, there's remote control triggering via a, a number of means. You can do time and interval shooting, um, and you can go for something like 100 hours with some of these devices, which is quite 
long enough for me. <laughs> um, you can you can uh, do commercial uh, work, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. It's particularly useful in um, hazardous environments, believe it or not. Um, stop motion, which we're all familiar with for some of the motion pictures that we've seen in the last few years. Um, and it's useful also in wildlife, wildlife and cityscape and landscape photography. And by the way, this, this hummingbird picture was definitely taken with the remote trigger. He's about, uh, just about as close as you can get and still focus the camera. That, that's got to be a thousandth of a second or less to freeze those hummingbird wings as well. Yeah, it is. It takes about twelve hundredth of a second to freeze the wings. So let's talk about the scope of discussion and some of the issues. You know, I said before, this is necessarily review within limits because it's a, it's a target-rich environment. There's a lot of options here. Um, you can start with simpler options and move to some very complex ones, which we will talk about. Um, starting with the shutter timer, which is built into most cameras, which simply allows you to press the shutter uh, once or twice, depending on how the camera operates, perhaps once halfway down to focus, and then as hold it down and then a second time to start the timer, which can run anywhere from 2 to 30 seconds. Uh, there are wired devices. There are devices that are infrared, RF. Uh, we have Wi-Fi devices, which you can operate on a, on a local network, um, smartphones, uh, computers. Uh, and again, it's, you can use simple or option rich, um, single shot, multi-frame video, stop motion. <laughs> it's almost overwhelming. I do recommend, however, that for most of this work, you're going to want to use a tripod or a camera stand or another support to help you frame the shot and minimize vibration. I think that, that's a really important point is that you can't just plunk the camera down on a table and expect that you're going to get good results. You really need a purpose-built camera support of some kind to make this work. And there's some safety and security issues too. Now real briefly, let's, let's just do a quick poll. I'd like to know um, what the state of the art is uh, out amongst the people who are watching this. So please answer all these that apply to your current work. Um, you use a cable or a wired release um, from, you know, consistently or from time to time. Oh, use please, a wire. please answer these in the poll function, not in the chat function, or your or your answers won't get tallied. Oh, thank you, David. Um, you know that's sort of like the the voice from above, <laughs> keeping me in line. Um, do you use a wireless camera trigger or shutter release? Um, do you control the camera via the camera manufacturer software? Both, example, for example, Canon and Nikon both offer these, uh, connected via a cable. Um, do you shoot tethered um, using Lightroom or other software via a cable? Or, and or do you shoot connected to a computer via Wi-Fi using any software? Now I can't see the control panel, so someone give me the uh, high sign when we're ready to continue. Well, the results are in, and it looks okay. like 74% use a cable or wired release, 62 use some kind of trigger or shutter release, 16 use camera control camera via the manufacturer's software, 37 shoot tethered, Lightroom, etc., and 13% use Wi-Fi or related. So that's that's a pretty heavy usage scenario. I think that that shows we're talking, we're preaching to the choir on the one hand, and yet uh, the lower numbers on the other things mean that uh, some of the technology that we'll be talking about today will definitely be of interest. Yeah, I think that it's very interesting. The shooting tethered using Lightroom is really straightforward. Um, it it doesn't require a Wi-Fi connection, for example. Um, the controls are, are very easy to read. Uh, if you're familiar with Lightroom, getting, it, getting the, the process started um, once the camera is connected is very straightforward. On the other hand, shooting via Wi-Fi can really be challenging. And actually, it doesn't, you know, unlike some other things, the degree of difficulty between Mac and Windows isn't that great, you know, the difference between them isn't that great. They're both kind of a pain in the neck. Um, once you understand it and get it going a couple of times on your own network, 
that's one thing that that can be repeatable. When you go over to someone else's network, it can get to be like starting over again. So I can I can understand why those differences are there. Well, it's important to note too that as quickly as cameras are are improving, that for some reason wireless and GPS are two features that are not getting rolled into all the new cameras at a at a good clip. So we're really not necessarily going to see those features for most users in in the near future. I think Canon has one camera that has Wi-Fi built in. And I, I'm with you. I'd like to see more cameras that have Wi-Fi built in, particularly for um, the kind of work that I do in commercial photography. Okay. Let's see here. There we go. Um, some tips, um, operational safety and security. Um, you really do need a stable tripod, a camera stand, or a mount. Um, if you're working outdoors, you really have to be aware of the wind and related factors. I saw a video the other day of this poor fellow who had put his really nice 503 Hasselblad on top of a pretty sturdy tripod, but the wind was blowing. And he was uh, working with the camera, and he turned around behind him to get something out of his camera bag, and of course the wind gusted. And you just, it's sort of like watching a, a train crash. You can't do anything about it. You're fascinated, horror. And of course, the camera tipped over and went into a tide pool. Uh, that was the end, of the, the end of the video, was him trying to rinse his camera off with fresh water. So, you know, be aware that once that camera is out of your hands, it just there's so many things that can happen. It, it, as simple as having a dog run into the tripod legs. Um, I've seen that happen too. So be aware of things you can't control. Um, weight the tripod if you can. Um, isolate the camera and the camera support from vibration and movement because as you go along, uh, and you're, let's say you're doing um, you know, timed release and you've got 100 photos, well, if a couple of those photos are blurry, it's going to ruin the whole run, something that you may have spent an hour or two on. Um, if you're mounting the camera using, for example, right here we have a suction cup for a GoPro, and suction cup actually provides camera tethers so that you put the camera on the suction cup and you tether the camera to something sturdy nearby. Let's say it's um, it's attached to a car. You might attach the, the tether to a part of the car so that if the camera mount comes loose, the camera isn't destroyed. Uh, and that's that's actually a trick that's that comes over from the theater business and from the movie making business where every light that's you know up, uh, suspended from a support some of yeah, from a support and every camera has a safety wire on it in case the primary support fails and that's just good practice it's something that'll keep you safe um, you want to protect your cable runs. You don't want people tripping over a cable that's running from your camera to the computer. It's entirely possible that they'll both go on the floor. Um, so a little gaffer's tape goes a long way. Um, a strain loop is simply a loop at the end or both ends that if the wire is suddenly pulled, that the loop takes up the slack. It provides some slack in the run so that it doesn't immediately pull something over. Uh, you want to secure your laptops and desktop computers if they're tethered. Um, and one thing that people don't think about as often as they should, and I have a friend who went through this just the other day with some equipment in his shop, is protect your power supplies. It's easy to forget when you're working on location that you're plugged into a power supply that may or may not be clean. And if you're plugged into that power supply and something goes wrong and there's a surge, uh, and it blows all your gear into the wild blue yonder, you're not going to be a happy camper. Mixing that no. but you get the idea. I have to admit here that I'm known among those people I shoot with, including Mr. Saffer, as a freehand shooter. There are days when uh, uh, I'm the one without a tripod, and David's pitch here, uh, his pitch to always use a tripod falls on deaf ears among street shooters in many cases. And for this type of work, it's absolutely true. I mean, it's not a matter of getting one good frame here. It's a matter of getting every good frame if you're using them for time lapse or if you're using them for 
you know, focal uh, extension or if you're using them for HDR. So, so this is not just tripod work. This is what I would call heavy tripod work. This is, you know, secure tripod work where, you know, your uh, nice convenient things like little Joby Gorilla Pods are wonderful for, for individual shots, but the consistency and security you need for, uh, for this kind of work really, you know, uh, speaks to large, stiff, secure tripods as the, uh, as the key element to success. Yeah, I, I'll say it again. If you're doing an hour-long series and you've got two or three frames that are not up to par, then that's a project that gets done over again. That's not exactly convenient. So you really have to, to, to master the details here in terms of your setup and your preparation. It's, it's going to be perhaps even more important than during ordinary photography. Now the on-camera shutter release, um, the delayed release, it's the simplest hands-off control. Um, it's, it's particularly useful if, if, even if you're going to take a single shot of a landscape with a long exposure, say more than half a second, um, you're going to find that it's built into the control dial or the LCD menus on most cameras, and the delay timing length is usually adjustable. Um, a couple of tips that most people don't know. If you're working with a DSLR, Close the, close the eyepiece, and you can see here on this Nikon camera that there's actually a lever and a, a little shutter that closes the eyepiece. And what's the reason for that? Well, when light comes in the back, it's bouncing around inside the camera, and it's, in many cases, ruining the exposure meter's uh, evaluation of the scene. And so if you, it, it's designed to work with your eye on the eyepiece, shading the eyepiece. If you're not going to be looking through the eyepiece, obviously not um, during one of these series or, uh, or star trails or whatever you're doing, then you want to cover that eyepiece. Now, if it doesn't have this device, a little piece of electrical tape or gaffer's tape will do the job just fine. Thank you very much. Um, but cover the eyepiece up so that your exposure is correct. Uh, you also, just for the sake of, um, I'm gonna, probably going to be repeating myself on this particular point, but you're pro probably better off in a lot of cases with this kind of work shooting in manual focus rather than autofocus. Um, I think it's, it's an obvious thing that the autofocus can create a delay on repeat shots. It may not necessarily focus on exactly the same thing. Uh, that does happen sometimes as the light changes and the contrast lines are altered by the light. So you're better off turning off the autofocus and using, man and using manual focus in these. If you're not familiar with mirror lockup, you should learn to be. Um, mirror lockup makes the camera much steadier, particularly for exposures that are a half second or less. And the reason is really simple. That camera is on springs. Um, it's got a, a motor attached to it, and it flips up and bangs against the stop at the top um, to uh, reveal the sensor or the film plane, and then it flips back down again and bangs the camera around again. And what you really want to do is lock up that mirror and leave it there, particularly on time series, and have the camera continue to shoot, and it'll be a much steadier camera. You'll get noticeably sharper pictures, particularly if you have a strong tripod. It doesn't necessarily have to be a carbon fiber tripod, by the way. You don't have to spend $1,000. Um, but a really strong metal tripod. Some of the video tripods are really you know, heavy, but very, very sturdy. Um, use a strong camera support. Lock the mirror up. Use a remote release. You'll get the sharpest pictures. And you'll see the difference. Yeah, shooting last year in Tuscany, comparing the Canon 5D Mark III and the uh, and the Nikon D800, we found that in landscape shooting, I mean, they they traded off as to which one was the better camera for different functions, though they're both excellent for both. But all of that extra resolution that the uh, that the Nikon offered required a heavy tripod and a cable release and what we call two click mode this put the, the the mirror up on the first click and then shoot the shot on the second click all of that was required to get that extra resolution to really show up if you didn't do that the resolution was there you were wasting the space on your disk but you weren't getting any more information in the image because it's that sensitive yeah it really does make a difference um... It's going to be interesting to see what the, um, the camera, I think they call it the camera shake filter in Photoshop, that new one is going to be able to do. 
Um, but I don't think there's ever going to be a substitute for getting it right in the camera. Uh, we're, yeah, we're talking about hacks here. We're talking about things to do when you do it wrong. And, um, yeah. and of course, the real goal is to learn how to do it right and then do it wrong when you have to. <laughs> now, there are wired shutter release um, devices. Uh, they can be limited to a, just a simple push button. Um, or they can include additional controls, and this one, I believe, is a Nikon. Um, these are not cheap. Um, the ones from the camera manufacturers, I'm sorry to say, I think are a bit pricey. Uh, there are less expensive ones that are made uh, typically offshore that seem to work just fine. I have one for my uh, for my Canon camera. My little, I have a little G10 that I use it. I use it for that. Um, and they're quite a bit less expensive. I don't know how durable or water protected or weather protected they are. But uh, there are some choices and it would pay you to do some research if this is something that you're interested in. Uh, but these obviously have to be connected directly to the camera. In this case, in the, in the case of the Nikon, there's a 10 pin connector. Now let's talk about shooting tethered. Um, tethered in this, in this particular instance, in this part of the discussion, refers to a wired connection and typically it's a USB or a firewire cable. Uh, a lot of the DSLRs, uh, even the top end ones, are using USB cables. Uh, I have a camera that uses a firewire cable. Um, those are typically length limited and so if you want to stretch that out you can get a cable that has a booster in it that will allow you to stretch out to say, uh, typically the limit is 10 to 15 feet will enable you stretch out to, my combination works to as long as 30 feet, and later on in the presentation I'll explain why I need that. Um, the computer has to be loaded with software that's compatible with the camera. So in other words, that software version, for example, uh, Lightroom keeps updating its list, capture, phase one, capture one keeps updating its list. The software has to include that camera as a supported device. If it doesn't, it's not going to see the camera, you're not going to be able to do any work with it. The nice thing about this is you can capture directly to the computer. In many cases, you can capture to the card in the camera and directly to the computer. Uh, but be warned, most of the time that slows the shooting tempo down. Uh, it has to write to both, and the card in the camera is quite a bit slower than, uh, say, a FireWire or a USB, fast USB connection. Um, there's at least two types. The camera manufacturers, such as Canon and Nikon, uh, make software for this. Um, sometimes the software is pretty pricey. The, the Nikon software is about $180. Uh, there's third-party software. Uh, Lightroom offers this as a, uh, a no-cost um, add-on, if you will. Uh, that works quite well. It's quite easy to use, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, phase One Capture One uh, is an excellent program, although it's a little pricey. Uh, I recommend it to people all the time. I happen to think that the, the RAW engine in Phase One is just a bit better than the one in Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw. And there's a little bit of rubber banding going on in the sense that Phase One sets the bar and Adobe catches up and then Phase One moves the bar again and Adobe chases after them. Uh, but I do see somewhat better color and certainly sharper images when I'm working with the Phase 1 software and converting those to raw files to, uh, for later work in my workflow. Okay, so this is our second and last poll. Um, I'm interested in how often people use Live View. Uh, so the first one is, and again, don't use the chat, use the poll uh, screen. Do you not usually use Live View or Remote View? Um, do you use Live View on camera only? Or do you use remote view such as on a tethered computer or iPad as an important part of your workflow? Now while this poll is going on, I'll comment that uh, those who shoot video with their DSLRs are intimately familiar with Live View and are so much more likely to use it than those who uh, shoot only still and are used to looking through the viewfinder which of course disappears when you uh, when you switch on live view so that's really the trade-off here is that big beautiful bright preview that you get when you're shooting uh, with a DSLR 
and the fact that you can really only see what's going on on the back of the camera when you're using live view, but that being a necessity for certain types of shooting and certainly for video. Yeah, I like live view for, for framing the shot. Um, it, it can be, um, you know, it's typically, it, particularly in low light circumstances, it can be brighter than an optical viewfinder. But the problem is, is that you can't really see much in the way of details on it in the screen the size of a DSLR. Certainly can't use it for focus. So results are in. We've got about half the people uh, using uh, live view during sessions, a third of them using uh, live view as part of their workflow, and only 16% using remote view from some other device. So that's, that's about right is all I can say to those answers. Okay. Now, going back to shooting tethered, uh, a wired connection, uh, the computer's loaded with compatible software, et cetera, et cetera. So we've been over that. Now, why is this giving me trouble? Hang on a second here. There we go. So starting tethered capture in Lightroom is really straightforward. Uh, you go, this is Lightroom 4. Uh, you go to File, Tethered Capture, and Start Tethered Capture, and here's your menu right here. And one would normally connect the camera to the computer before you started this. And the first panel that's going to come up is the Tethered Capture settings, and this is really a nice, concise control panel. I like this because it's easy to understand, easy to operate, and still very flexible and gives you some power over what's going on. Um, you're going to make a session name. Uh, you're going to, I'm going to skip down, you're going to tell it where the photos are going to go. Uh, you can segment photos by shots. In other words, if you've got shots that are similar, they can be segmented that way. Um, you can create a template. Okay, you can start the photo numbers uh, any way you like. And I think one of the greatest things about this um, is that you can set up metadata templates so that while you're shooting the metadata is applied to the file as it's stored on the computer. That's going to save a lot of work in post-production provided that you get, you know, you think a little bit ahead of time and get your metadata down there. It's going to make your images easier for you to find and it's going to make your images easier for art directors to find. It makes them more sellable. So you really want to pay attention to this. You want to have a really nice, complete set of metadatas, metadata entries um, and take care of business up front rather than trying to go back and do it later. Now, in Lightroom, there's some powerful tools for doing this, and you can do global adjustments to them, but why not get it right in the camera and get it into the file right at the beginning? When you're done with this panel and you click OK, this control bar is going to come up. And working from left to right, it's going to uh, pop up with an indicator of which camera you're using, uh, the name of the session. And I happen to do a screenshot of this with a different session, so the name differs than the one above. Uh, it just depends on what you put in the box. It tells you which shot you're on. And it's going to tell you what the camera settings are. But perhaps unlike some other software packages, it doesn't allow you to change the camera settings from the computer. It's simply reporting what the camera is doing. Okay, and the develop settings, um, those are being set in Lightroom. There's actually whole classes taught on working with presets and as you import pictures, uh, applying the presets to different sets of photographs, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to get into that right now. I think that's information that's readily available. Um, the develop settings, you can set them for the first shot and then you can go same as previous. You can pick a preset from here. And then as you push on this white button, it will fire the camera for you. So it's very straightforward. It works pretty darn fast. Uh, it's, it's not what you would call a slow poke in any, in any stretch of the imagination. Um, very, very useful and powerful tool. It used to be this was considered a, uh, a simplistic tool for those who didn't want to pay for the expensive stuff. And I'm not sure that that's a fair description of this anymore. I think that there's lots of people whose uses are covered quite nicely by this. I agree. And particularly since Lightroom 4 came out with all the extra features and things like that, it's, uh, 
it's an option that's really worth thinking about. Now I'm going to reinforce the, uh, the keyword issue here that uh, I am about a quarter of a million images behind in my keyword. Do <laughs> you think I'm ever going to catch up, David? So uh, the real batch deal here is two words for you: batch processing. <laughs> yeah, well, broken leg are the two words I use. Someday I'll be in traction in a hospital bed, and I might actually catch up. In the meantime, uh, put it in up front because the only keywords that I have in my images are the ones that I put in there. As you know, before I shot them or as I downloaded them, because getting back to do it later is just never going to happen. Yeah, afraid so. Now this is phase one, capture one. Um, this is from a commercial shoot I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, and one of the things I like about phase one is that as you're, you can control the camera from the panel, okay, you can see that right here. It tells you which camera is connected. Um, you, it tells you what ISO you're working with. Uh, and there is a color balance um, in this particular panel so that if I had a spider cube in the picture here, which I should have done uh, for this demonstration, I would slide over here and I would um, click on it and I would neutralize the photograph, click on the gray area. Up here you can see it says next capture adjustments, all other copy from last. So what happens is if I have the cube in the first photo and I click on the gray and I neutralize the photograph for that lighting condition, every photograph that's taken after that is going to be neutralized to the same uh, gray point, to the same color balance. So that's really, really useful. There are other controls in here. It's very feature rich um, and, and very complete. Again, I'm not going to get into the, the whole enchilada simply because it would take too much time and perhaps confuse the issue here. This is an option for those of you with the high-end cameras. Phase 1 supports at least as many cameras as Lightroom does. It is a more sophisticated program. Um, my personal opinion is that it does outperform in processing raw images to high-bit TIFFs for further work. Uh, if your workflow goes uh, from raw processing to Photoshop, this is uh, an option to consider. Yeah, the only inverse comment on that is learning curve. You know, it's it's more more powerful. Um, Going to take just a little longer to get comfortable with it. Yeah, it's not awful, but this definitely would be uh, more involved. Now, I talked before about commercial work or, or safety issues in, in different environments. And this device, I'm sure, is pretty mysterious. This is a disinfection device that uses um, high-powered ultraviolet light to kill viruses and bacteria in environments like hospital rooms. And this is a cardiac cath lab, et cetera, et cetera. And the thing is, is the client wanted this photograph taken with the tubes energized. Well. I really have two choices when I do this. It's either to wear a spacesuit right from NASA so that I don't um, turn into barbecue David photographer. Uh, because you can, if you stand in the room with this for 10 seconds, you can feel your skin frying. Uh, or I can wear a spacesuit, or I can set the camera up, get everything just as it should be. And you know, based on experience, I know what the exposure should be to show the lights properly and then run a cable outside the room and run the camera from my laptop. And think of it something like an x-ray technician um, you know, taking a chest x-ray of a person. You're behind a barrier so that you're not going to be irradiated. <laughs> That's basically what it is. And it's very useful in environments that are using machine tools. Uh, you can get back away from it in case something goes wrong. Uh, in environments where there, even if there's a lot of vehicular traffic, um, and you don't want to be standing next to the roadway, all of those things. Uh, the tethering makes it safer for the photographer, and you really don't give up anything in terms of image quality. It's not particularly hard to set up. It just takes a little bit of practice. Canon, um, now you got something there, David? Yep. Canon offers the EOS utility uh, and some more things, and this actually comes with most of their high-end cameras, and you can see in one spot on here, the camera settings and remote shooting. If you trigger this, you're going to get this panel. Now, 
this does look complicated, and it is, but it lets you control just about every aspect of camera operation from the computer. Um, this is typically done with a wired connection. It's the simplest way to do it. However, they can also be done wirelessly. The wireless setup, uh, to be blunt about it, is complex and challenging. Uh, you have to really understand wireless networks. Uh, you have to, in some cases, set up what you can see on here, a monitor folder or a hot folder for um, the Canon utility to look, look for pictures arriving. Uh, but it does give you a live view on the cameras that support that. It, will support, it supports HDR mode. Uh, it lets you do quite a number of things with software. It will take practice. It's, it's not a slam dunk, but it's one of the more feature-rich versions of this. Another uh, caveat with this is that if you do want to use it wirelessly, with, all but ex with the exception of one camera that Canon makes, you're going to have to buy a wireless transmitter for the camera, and they're not cheap, not cheap at all. Now, I'm going to point out that this little window on the right that we're looking at in here looks suspiciously like the control on an advanced light meter or illuminance meter. And if you're the type of person who's comfortable with that type of a tool, then you'll probably be fine with this one. And if you aren't, then you might want to look for a more intuitive solution. Yeah, that kind of, if you've got use of a light meter in your um, fund of knowledge, certainly this is a familiar format, familiar layout, and it would help you uh, climb up the learning curve. Now, I think I said this already, but I'll go over it again. Um, there may be a cost for the software. For example, Nikon's version of this, the Nikon Camera Control Pro 2, is about $180, which I think is a little pricey for that. Um, very few cameras have Wi-Fi built in, so you have to buy additional hardware, but it's a good feature set. Uh, in some cases, you can get live view. But keep in mind that a Wi-Fi setup versus a wired setup can be challenging. And I've read through the instructions. I've never actually done one of those myself because I've, I've looked at it and I thought, my gosh, um, I don't have an IT guy. And if something goes wrong during the shoot, uh, I'm in trouble. So I'm going to go the safe route and I'm going to use a wired setup. That's what I do. Now let's talk a little bit about our sponsor, our co-sponsor, pardon me. Trigger Trap, very, very ingenious, very clever setup here. It allows you to use your smartphone uh, or your iPad, and I believe they work both in the iPad and some of the Android versions. And it's really a two, it's really a two-part device. You can see one is connected here to a camera, and you can see that there's a red cable that comes out of the dongle that goes into the audio out port on the handheld device. And then there's another cable that goes to the control port on the camera. And I might not get this exactly right, but what it what what the dongle does is actually trans the software generates an audio signal that tells the dongle what to tell the camera. Now that's as far as I've gotten from a technical standpoint with that. It's a little bit like voodoo. It works great. Um, there are quite a few different control panels in this software. Um, they've thought of just about everything humanly possible that you can do with a camera. Before we move on from this slide, I want to point out there's no, there's no scale element to the, to the physical components of this that are shown at the lower left. Now, I'm traveling for a month and a half right now with carry-on luggage. I have nothing with me that, that's larger or bulkier than necessary, and yet I have one of these trigger trap systems for my camera with me because, you know, it, it, if you put it in your luggage, it takes about as much room as, you know, half a dozen quarters and weighs a little less. So this is really a very uh, space-efficient, cost-efficient, uh, weight efficient thing to keep with you because then when you get somewhere and you say wow I really can't take this shot uh, without you know a, a cable release at the very least uh, and I'd really rather be you know over there hiding behind that tree uh, you know even for simple simple release uses like that this is handy and then if you want to get into anything more complicated it's really um, you know 
the ultimate lightweight solution for for you know, advanced uses that I'm sure David's going to cover on the next slide or two. Yep. Um, it doesn't require batteries either, just to add that little bit. Now, we have a basic cable release set up here. Uh, it does let you change the camera mode, although I would encourage you to shoot in manual mode if you can. It would be manual exposure and manual focus because both of those things slow the camera down. So if you're doing time lapse, for example, you can get into issues of um, lag with the camera, with some cameras. Uh, time lapse, very straightforward. How many photos do you want to take over how much time? It'll tell you how many photos you're going to take every 16 seconds, and you press the button, and the thing starts rolling. It does support iOS and Android. It supports over 280 camera models and variants, uh, remote single shot triggering and time lapse. It'll do HDR or HDR time lapse. And HDR time lapse has got me interested. I think that could be really, really amazing if it's done right. Um, we have uh, options for what's called distance. In other words, if you mount the camera on a car and you tell it how far you want to go and how many shots you want to take, uh, it will uh, take photographs spaced out over that um, that distance, that that you know, length of travel. Uh, eased time lapse, you can set it to speed up or slow down at different points in a time lapse. Uh, let's say the car is slowing down, but you want to keep the pace of the video the same. Uh, you can do that. It will do star trails. It will do motion and face detection. Uh, one cool thing that I think is, is pretty darn amazing, you can make this a Wi-Fi slave, uh, provided that you have a local area network, uh, wi local Wi-Fi, you can use two handheld devices, connect them via the network, and you can use, for example, one smartphone to drive another smartphone which wirelessly, which is driving the camera. Um, that's a pretty amazing thing and certainly doesn't require the kind of expense and complexity that we see in the, in the devices and software that's supplied by the camera manufacturers. Um, so I'm really interested in trying that out. I'm going to, uh, I'm certainly going to be going forward with that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and again, practice and shoot in manual focus mode and manual exposure when you can. There's a convergence going on here between the HDR time lapse end of thing and the and the high bit video end, so that um, this type of device and the type of um, raw shooting that is now becoming possible with the 5D Mark III by using the, uh, the Magic Lantern software, it's all headed in the same direction from from opposite ends. So we're getting an incredibly rich environment uh, that we can work with affordably. I mean, where this is all about affordable. It's not that you couldn't do it before, it's that it was more complicated and more expensive. Well, yeah, as, as much as $1,000, and now we're looking at a, a software application um, and a device that's, you know, the, the most you could spend if you really worked at it would be, you know, less than $100. So it's, it's really, go I think things are really going in the right direction here. It's, this is a game changer in terms of risk. If you're willing to put your backup body in this low-cost device out there, and yeah, maybe the lion will <laughs> eat the game that you put out for bait, or maybe he'll eat your camera, and it probably is okay either way because you're just not making that massive risk. Uh, I've seen pictures of a bear running around with a uh, Canon DSLR in his mouth, so it's, it's already happened. <laughs> There's a few more screens here to show you. Um, one of the things that's, that's kind of interesting about this is they've thought of the differences in the physical and engineering layouts of the cameras. So for example, if you have a camera that has a delay before the trigger or you want to, it's not sensitive enough and you want to increase the trigger pulse length, uh, you've got issues with shutter lag or you want a certain delay after triggering for whatever reason. Um, in fact, the delay before trigger, I think, is used for autofocus. If you had an issue with slow autofocus, you can build in more of a delay. Um, and so they've thought of that and, and the physical differences between cameras, camera bodies, and, and lens setups. 
Um, you've got HDR time lapse, which um, all I can say is I think you probably need a pretty big memory card in your camera. <laughs> Um, well, those, those are the same memory cards that you're going to need to shoot uh, raw video. So we're all moving towards, you know, investing in a $350 memory card so that we can do raw video. And once we have that, then all this stuff kind of comes free in the package. That Magic Lantern software really is going to be a game changer, I think. And then, and then of course, Star Trails. Um, it will take exposures, uh, however many you want. Um, it'll set them for a certain number of minutes. Now this example of 23 minutes for each exposure seems a little bit long to me, but maybe not. And then with a gap of 10 seconds, and it tells you how long it will take, which is 39 hours, a little bit over the top. Uh, but it shows you that it's completely variable. These are you know analog style sliders. Um, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and there's more screens than this. I'm just showing you a few of them. Uh, I, I would encourage you to go to the Trigger Trap website and take a look at what the capabilities of this system are. I think you'll be impressed. Yeah, go, go to the App Store and download the application, which is either free or low cost, depending on whether they're running a special right now. And play with it, because many of the, f the simpler functions of this can be done with the camera in your phone to learn it. So if you have a little tripod for your iPhone or whatnot, you can actually set it up and play with this and get so you actually know how this works before you invest you know even in the uh, in the remote uh, equipment for running your real camera with this and my prediction is you will be addicted uh, <laughs> yeah and, and, and the, the little things I mean when, when we talk about face recognition and um, motion sensor I mean those are nice technical terms but you have to translate that back into English and say uh, security camera and game camera because that's what they turn your device into. Oh, I didn't think of that. That's a good idea. Could spy on people. That's, that's what you keep me around for, David. <laughs> they do have the Wi-Fi slave uh, capability. Uh, the Wi-Fi triggering mode um, sets up one mobile device as a slave and the other as a master. You have to be connected via local network. Now, how that might work if you, for example, were out in the field and you took a laptop with you, it's not something I've tried, but it's occurred to me that that could be useful too, not just indoors. Um, one thing to keep in mind is Wi-Fi triggering, in this case, is a one-shot trigger. It only sends a please trigger now signal, so it doesn't work for bulb modes, um, HDR, star trail, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very useful for single shot. Uh, it's 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 got the issue of what the range of that local network would be a uh, and b it's in in this one particular case it's not going to be um, really that much more useful say than a long wired connection uh, or an RF trigger. Uh, on the other hand, it's much less expensive than a lot of the other things that we've been talking about. Well, we're going to finish about 10 minutes early this time. I want to thank Data Color and Trigger Trap for their sponsorship and their kind support of this session. It's very greatly appreciated. Uh, Data Color's website, datacolor.com and triggertrap.com, please do visit those websites and check them out. There's a lot of really great educational content on the datacolor.com website, both on the blog and in terms of recorded webinars. This webinar will be recorded. Uh, is being recorded and will be posted uh, within a week. Uh, we have 11 winners. We're not for once. We're not going to announce them. It's going to take too long. One lucky person will get a spider checker, and there will be 10 trigger traps. Uh, Patty, our marketing manager, will be getting in touch with you to let you know that you're a winner and get your contact information. Discounts and rebates. There's 15% off all trigger trap products purchased at shoptriggertrap.com. The promo code is, and it's case sensitive, all caps, data color. It's valid through 616, that should be 13, 2013, that's a typo on my part. 20% um, off all spider color pro spider products purchased at spider.datacolor.com, and the promo code is lowercase remote 20, and that's valid through June 6, 2013. 
Um, I'd like to point out that both David, Toby, and I have um, WordPress blog sites and websites. There's a lot of good educational information on both. Um, on my blog, there's tutorials on all kinds of uh, different subjects. DavidSaffer.wordpress.com. I want to remind you that I do try to answer questions from my students. Uh, DSaffer at Mac.com. If I don't answer you right away, it just means I got a lot of email that day. Don't be shy about bugging me. Send another email 24 hours later and make sure that I answer you. Um, I, I, I apologize, but I do get a lot of email traffic on a daily basis, particularly after a session like this. So if you don't get an answer in 24 hours, bug me the next day and I'll answer you. Uh, David Toby's WordPress blog, cdtoby.wordpress.com. It's a great blog, very popular, has a lot of great information on it. Uh, he's a real thought leader uh, in the field. And of course, his website is cdtoby.com. We have other webinars coming up later this month and into July and August. So check the website and check your email. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and we hope that you uh, come back and visit us again.